For those of you who have been active as a Marxist for uh, any period of time, really, it doesn't take very long, <laughs> you'll inevitably have been confronted with phrases along the lines of, like, oh, we need uh, to be a bit more nuanced than this. You know, things are very complex. Um, Marxism's a bit out of date, uh, actually, isn't it? It's a bit old-fashioned. It's very simplistic, very reductionist. Um, it reduces everything to just economics, basically, and is, is very kind of uh, controlling uh, in its, you know, the way that it, it sees the world. Um, these are typical kind of postmodernist um, lines of reasoning, or they're not even really lines of reasoning, they're more just sort of ways of expressing doubts, which is basically what it boils down to. And um, you'll also be familiar with other terms like discourse, uh, the emphasis on difference, always emphasising the differences between things. And also in general, in the modern era, or postmodern era, a tendency t uh, towards uh, cynicism and irony, you know, um, or sort of pseudo-irony, you know, just sort of sneering at things, especially anything that's um, very earnest or, or sincere, is that's like the most embarrassing thing you could possibly be. I think these things that we're all sort of, to one degree or another, familiar with this kind of air of, this kind of atmosphere that hangs around, especially uh, on the left or in, on the academic left. And, uh, and really that's the influence of postmodernism. And um, postmodernism is very important for us to understand because, um, first of all, I would say it's probably the dominant uh, mode of attack that the ruling class has had in terms of theory on Marxism over the last 30 or so years. And um, so, it's, you know, it's been really kind of the ideology, I, I suppose, of the last 20 or 30 years um, in the main. And also, I, it, it, that's perhaps waning now, but in the current situation, identity politics is clearly... Heavy, although many people who subscribe to it would actually reject that they are postmodernists, but it clearly bears the stamp of, of postmodernism and the influence of postmodernism. Um, and that's obviously a huge um, uh, influence, on the, on the, especially on the student left, so that's something that we need to understand. Now, how do we understand postmodernism? Because it's, it's, to a point of principle, it's extremely eclectic, uh, and it's, it's self-contradictory, uh, almost deliberately so. In fact, it sometimes is deliberately self-contradictory. Um, doesn't really make sense much of the time. And it, in fact, it eschews the idea of making sense um, or of rationality in many respects. And it's, so it's hard to define. Um, you couldn't really boil it down to sort of any co coherent ideas in this sense. And, and mainly, it defines itself in opposition to what it calls modernism, which we have to say uh, is a term I think that we should reject because modernism is not a Marxist or a scientific term. But basically what they mean when they reject modernism is they reject uh, progress, or the, rather the idea of progress, the idea, you know, the idea that exists in different political ideologies that humanity makes progress over time, uh, of the bourgeois enlightenment, a, rejection, a tendency to reject science and re rationality um, as, as uh, you know, these are seen as oppressive things, basically. And objectivity as a category is also frequently uh, rejected. So postmodernism is really more defined by what it rejects. It sees these things, you know, science, science, rationality, the idea of progress as being dominant in the Western world over the last two or three hundred years. And it basically says uh, that they're wrong or that they're passé or something like that and they need to be superseded. And I would say that, that therefore, the way we should really categorise postmodernism and modernism uh, is not in terms of the ideas themselves, uh, which we reject. I, I, I don't think modernism really is an idea or a set of ideas. But we should look at them from a historical materialist point of view and understand that what, what it, this really references is two great phases of capitalism. That is to say, modernism broadly corresponds to the progressive phase of capitalism, the phase in which capitalism was growing was developing the productive forces in a very meaningful way uh, and taking society forwards. And then the period roughly coinciding with the beginning of the First World War, accelerating at different points in history in which capitalism begins to decline 
uh, goes into a phase of deindustrialization, um, and you know everything that we, we're familiar with from the last uh, sort of thirty or so years, in particular. Um, but the reason we check the term modernism, um, which the postmodernists use in a very flippant way, um, is that it's, it lumps together wildly different things. And from a postmodernist point of view, Marxism and liberalism are both modernism and are kind of the same, really, because they both believe in progress and science. Uh, and in doing so, they do an incredible disservice to Marxism, whose understanding of science is far more complex and nuanced, to use very uh, trendy postmodernist kind of terms, uh, than, than was liberalism's. Uh, and of course, they stand on opposing class points of view. Liberalism, of course, is really the ideology of capitalism and of the ruling class. And Marxism, obviously, is that of socialism and the working class. So you, to, to just lump the two together like that is, is, uh, is extremely bad. Nevertheless, there is a certain, as I said, there is a certain uh, uh, reason that they've done so, which is that both those ideologies were born, really, in a phase in which capitalism uh, was in the ascendancy. Um, <coughs> anyway, so postmodernism technically begins much later, but the first tendencies towards it, I think, can be seen in particular with Nietzsche, uh, who is a, a, an enormous influence on many postmodernists. And... That's not a coincidence that, that it is Nietzsche, because Nietzsche obviously was writing at the end of the 19th century, when capitalism was perhaps beginning to bear signs of its, of its impasse, you know, of the, the gross excesses of industrialization, you know, the slums in cities. And, and what Nietzsche really um, reflected was a pessimism about science and about progress. So, and he was, considered himself and is seen as an irrationalist someone who rejects the idea of an objective world, really, and of, of science, basically. Um, and he sees science as just a means to control people. And obviously, in doing so, he was reflecting a, re a certain realisation that much of the science, um, or that much of the effects of science in the 19th century, and of course, especially in the 20th century, were, were used for violent and oppressive means rather than to liberate people. And so he's a very important thinker, but is not strictly... It's not a postmodernist, but it really reflects the same kind of process. And then in the early 20th century, you have a number of um, thinkers uh, who are not postmodernists again, but begin to use the term post, saying we live in a postmodern era. And of course, this is the era of the Great Depression and of the two world wars. And you have a growing pessimism, basically, seeping in uh, to, to the ruling class. And these thinkers I'm referring to are ruling class thinkers. They were mainly very conservative the people who first using the term postmodern, they were not aligned with anything progressive at all. And in fact, they hated the modern world. They saw it as filthy and dirty, you know, unpleasant, basically. And uh, they wanted to go back to more old-fashioned values. Um, but they, 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 they were reflecting this pessimism about the way society was going, which obviously reflected the impasse of capitalism, especially in that era. Then after the Second World War, you have a few more intellectuals saying similar things. Uh, Peter Drucker, for instance, identified quite presciently uh, postmodernism with the post-industrial epoch. And I say presciently because, of course, in the 1950s, which is when he was writing, um, post-industrialism, if, or if you like, deindustrialization, hadn't really begun properly uh, in countries like Britain and America. But he anticipated it and could see, could, could see that there was something had changed or was beginning to change in society. And an, a kind of an atmosphere of nihilism amongst certain intellectuals began to spread. Nietzsche himself is often seen as a sort of harbinger of, of nihilism as well. Um, uh, there's yeah, this enormous pessimism seeping in. And, and also as um, the boom, the post-war boom, and the success of Keynesianism and Fordism really began to decline, uh, and, and cracks in it began to appear, you know, in the, the inflation that he had in the, in the, in the early 70s, and, uh, you know, in, in this, this was anticipated often in the 60s by a number of thinkers who began to say that science is, uh, doesn't really bring any progress at all. And uh, really, there's no order to reality. Reality is disordered. Things are different from each other. And you can't really know the way. If, it is, if there is a way that things work, you can't really know the way. It's, it's not really a, an original idea. But nevertheless, the, the, the sort of bubbling up of these ideas in that period did express something. Jeffrey Barraclough in 1964, and this is very, he's not a postmodernist um, really, but he reflected the same kind of tendencies. 
really hit the nail on the head for how they think, where, where he said, we must stress differences and discontinuity. Whereas apparently modernism is characterised by seeing unity in things. In other words, by saying, well, the world is, has these features you know, in a universal way. You know, every country, for instance, is capitalist and capitalism works in a, in a definite way. That would be, for them, too much of a unifying idea. We should stress discontinuity. We should stress how things are different and certain laws don't apply from one country to another. Um, <clears throat> And then, just before the postmodernists proper really begin, you have other thinkers like Roland Barth, the Frankfurt School as well, <clears throat> and Guy Debord, various thinkers who, again, very pessimistic, especially uh, after the Second World War, especially the Frankfurt School, looking at uh, the experience of the Second World War, the nuclear bomb, the Holocaust, basically said that science just brings death um, and, uh, and uh, the, the laws of Marxism and the class struggle don't really apply anymore because um, science and the bureaucracy, uh, obviously very much reflecting the post-war boom with the growth in bureaucracy that you had and the nationalisation of many industries, uh, and also Stalinism, they said that well, the bureaucracy now has sort of superseded the class struggle uh, and the interests of science um, and rationality now dominate everything and there is no real class struggle anymore or it's been blunted. Um, and uh, we're now basically all just victims of this kind of scientific rationality. Um, this very pessimistic kind of mood, very negative, abandoning all idea of real progress or of, um, of, of socialism. Um, and this, so this, this really began to catch on. And also, <clears throat> another te- tendency to, to look at things from a cultural point of view rather than, say, an economic or a political one is very much... Um, uh, is something that the Frankfurt School in particular really took on and is very important for postmodernism. Basically, of course, after the Second World War, you had an explosion in the West of what they would call the culture industry. In other words, you know, uh, pop music, you know, mass culture, movies, etc. <clears throat> and they basically said that, you know, well, this means that everyone's kind of under the ideological control of capitalism now and there's no real escape because we're just bombarded with these images. And that also is something that's very influential on the postmodernists. But postmodernism really begins a little bit later, really in the 70s. And basically, all of the early postmodernists, the most influential postmodernists, hail from Paris. <coughs> and um, <coughs> although <coughs> it did catch on, it became very popular, in particular in America following this. But really, it all began in Paris. Um, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all is Stalinism, and I don't think you can really understand postmodernism without the role of Stalinism. <clears throat> Many of the postmodernist intellectuals were in and around the Stalinist movement. Of course, Stalinism in France was very big, at least prior to 1968. The French Communist Party was extremely large and uh, was, uh, you know, did very well in the opinion polls. And uh, it was extremely Stalinist, obviously. And it propagated an extremely mechanical interpretation of Marxism, uh, a very fatalistic one, you know, that the revolution is just going to come and we don't really need to do very much and we don't need to politically intervene and show a way forward. It's just a sort of an automatic process, which was really just an excuse in many respects for their uh, opportunist behaviour, really. But anyway, I don't have time to go into that. But that was, that was the... Um, <clears throat> That was the, 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 the interpretation of Marxism that was common in France and in many other countries, obviously. And these intellectuals were in and around uh, the, the, the French Communist Party. So that was what they understood by Marxism. Although I think that does them a bit too much credit. I think they deliberately also chose a, a, a caricature of Marxism because it was easy to argue against. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's the influence that they had. And so that's one reason why... Postmodernism started there, I think, because it's basically a rejection or a, a, um, a revulsion from that very mechanical version of Marxism. And then, of course, you also had May 68, which is uh, of enormous significance, happened obviously just before the 1970s. Many of these intellectuals were involved in that. And, of course, May 68 was a huge working-class movement, biggest, one of the biggest general strikes in history, um, and really a revolution. However... It did have this side to it, this very studenty, arty side to it, uh, which has been emphasised as if that's the main thing that really happened. And um, 
I think that's what they interpreted from these events, these intellectuals. They took that as a, as a sort of lesson that really that's the character of revolutions or of progressive politics in the future, not kind of classic working class movement and organisations. Um, and so the, the impact of that, I think, was really um, important on them. And then, of course, also in the 1970s, you had the first post-war recession, worldwide, worldwide re recession, and the crisis of Keynesianism, basically, that led, of course, to Thatcherism and privatisation and the rest of it. And so that mood of, of pessimism about this post-war boom was also incredibly important. Um, and so that's really the background to the rise of these uh, post-modernists. And a huge amount of what they... I mean, in many respects, the defining feature of postmodern uh, writing is, is basically an argument, often a veiled argument, but essentially an argument against Marxism, uh, against what they call meta-narratives. Uh, and they also sort of lump Freud in with that for some reason. But basically, they're arguing against Marxism, which is a meta-narrative, you know, in other words, an overarching perspective on the pro progress and development of human society. Uh, and that that's really dominates their thinking. And it's an absurd straw man because they, as I said it, it's an absurdly mechanical interpretation of Marxism. Uh, extremely you know, caricatured, one-sided. And they don't even, when you read it, they don't even really bother to actually <laughs> prove that that's what Marxism is. They just take these caricatures and then basically say, well, that's passe now and that's, that's wrong, basically. And we need to move forwards. Um, and uh, it really reflects the, the kind of ivory tower position that they were in as these intellectuals. Don't really need to analyse the real events in the working class uh, around the world, uh, the role of working class organisations and what actually happened in these revolutions. They don't, they don't need to do that. They just take a couple of stereotypes of Marx and then just kind of rail against that. Um, and... Um, <clears throat> And you find that also when they argue that we now are in a, this postmodern epoch and, and no longer in a modern epoch, there's very little in the way of a theory to explain this and why this has happened. It's just an assertion, really, and an elaborate list of things. You know, just, oh, this happened, and then you had, like, TV everywhere, and you had loads of images being, sh you know, everyone just looking at images the whole time. Which doesn't really prove anything just to say that, but they just kind of endlessly repeat this, which also, I think, reflects their... their um, a very privileged position as these intellectuals very removed from real working class conditions. Um, and of course you had a very similar phenomenon prior to 1968 as well where many other intellectuals like the Frankfurt School were saying, well, everyone, all the working class is bourgeoisified now and they'll never rise up again. And then you had May 68. None of them learnt the lesson of that, of course. They just assumed that they hadn't been disproven and kept on, on the same course. And so one, what you find with, these, with the postmodernists is, is a, tr a, a kind of very flippant tendency to just turn everything upside down, you know? It's just an assertion that, well, all of this is finished now. All of this science and progress and, uh, you know, Marxism and meta-narratives, it's all finished. Don't we all know it? It's so obvious. And let's just do everything the complete opposite way now. And they, so they just kind of make a principle out of just this kind of very extreme and loud rejection uh, without any real methodology to it, um, and uh, just you know, just very little attempt to prove what they're saying. Um, you find, for instance, with uh, Derrida, who's a very important postmodernist, a uh, a way of looking at the world where, obsessed with textual analysis, everything is just about texts. There's no real analysis of what's going on in society. It's just about what's being written in literature, as if that's all that society is apparently, um, and, uh, and the assertion is that, well, there's no real objective text, you know, there's no author who defines what the text is, there's no author who, who, whose intention has to be understood. A text can be interpreted in any way, and um, really texts just change all the time depending on who reads them, and they all overlap with each other, and, um, and really that's just, it's just a kind of chaos, really. Um, that's kind of the the sort of general outlook that they have, the general methodology that they have, and, and a very extreme form of idealism as well, where, as I said, they just tend to analyse texts or other you know, intellectual phenomena, cultural phenomena, without really any reference, with the possible exception of Foucault, who's arguably the most important postmodern, without really any reference to what's actually happening in society, the concrete events that are taking place.
Um, I would argue that the most important idea behind all of the postmodernist thinkers, from Foucault to Lyotard to Baudrillard, etc., is this idea of um, what they call decentering, you know, or being anti totalizing. I think Foucault would always say we must reject totalizing thoughts, which they mean by which they mean, you know, anything that tends to synthesize ideas into an overarching ideology, you know, or that finds a f- sort of a law or principle at the heart of any particular phenomena. They become obsessed with emphasizing that things are different from each other. There's no general law that you will find that governs any particular process. Um, and, you know, just, there's just different things happening in different places, basically. And an insistence that the tendency to center things or totalize thoughts is really... Um, uh, is, is really a form of sort of intellectual imperialism or something. Is is a sort of an attempt to control and hem in thought to prevent people from thinking freely, basically. And as a result, many of them, many of these intellectuals, emphasise the body as an alternative. Uh, and you'll find this, this this phrase comes up. Or there's many kind of catch phrases that they have, like space is another one that you hear all the time. It drives me mad. Anyway, one of them is uh, the body. Everything's about the body. Um, and uh, the body is the locus of oppression. And f- strange phrases like that that really sound very confusing and complex but don't really actually say very much, in my opinion. And the reason they emphasize the body is a sort of an anti rational, anti intellectual thing, really. That the, the body and its desires, which, atten- which um, uh, Deleuze and Guattari and, and Leotard, who are some of the absolutely key postmodernists, See that the, bo- the passions of the body is a sort of is a sort of primitivism. It's like the it's, it's very similar to anarchism in many respects. That the body uh, needs to be set free from from ideas and theory, and and just sort of go with the flow, if you like. Um, I'm going to give a quote here from Leotard, which really I think sums up not only this idea, in other words, that we don't need a theory, we just need to sort of do things passionately, but also the frankly, at times, appalling style that they adopt in their writing. Um, so, you know, I'll just give this quote from Leotard. Who's, what he's saying in this quote, um, Leotard was a, one of the key French postmodernists in the 1970s. Um, what he's saying in this quote is what the new kind of revolutionary politics should be like or will be like. Uh, he says, more important than political leftism Closer to, sorry, I find it hard not to laugh sometimes when I read. <laughs> Closer to a concurrence of the intensities, a vast subterraneous movement, wavering, <clears throat> more of a ruffle, in fact, on account of which the law of value is disaffected. Holding up production, uncompensated seizures as modalities of consumption, refusal to work, question mark, illusory communities, happenings, Sexual liberation movements, occupations, squattings, abductions, productions of sounds, words, colours, with no artistic intention. Here are the men of production, the masters of today, marginals, experimental painters, pop, hippies and yippies, parasites, madmen, binned loonies. One hour of their lives offers more intensity and less intention than 300,000 words of a professional philosopher. Well, certainly this professional philosopher doesn't seem to have uh, much profound to say. Uh, You can see, I think, the influence of 1968 uh, over this. You know, this idea that just sort of doing art in some general way is more liberatory. I think the petty bourgeois character of these ideas is extremely obvious Um, And I I find it amusing because obviously they want to reject the Marxist idea that social being determines consciousness, that, you know, your position in society in the main usually really determines how you think. Uh, They want to reject that. And I can't really think of a better proof that that is the case than a bunch of French intellectuals coming out with this kind of stuff uh, that really justify basically just writing anything and everything whenever you feel like. Um, <clears throat> another two other key postmodernist intellectuals are Deleuze and Guattari. Much of postmodernism has a very anarchist flavour to it. Usually they don't say that. Um, but Deleuze and Guattari, I think, do identify as anarchists. 
And after May 68 and the failure of May 68, um, instead of drawing the conclusion that, well, that shows the need, you know, for um, not for some sort of studenty kind of approach to it, but really a clear revolutionary leadership, the conclusion they drew was, no, we need more of that, basically. And uh, they, they really um, decided to, to go on a war with, um, with Marxism and uh, what they call Hegelianism. And they use these terms very vaguely, but basically they mean and dialectics. But what they understand by di dialectics is very one-sided. For them, dialectics, again, is all about centering or, or totalizing things, synthesizing things, bringing thoughts together, you know, coming up with a, a general theory which explains a range of phenomena. For them, that is the worst thing. That is the, the source of oppression. So they say, essentially, that we need to, um, uh, you know, like just not really have any center to our thoughts, really. That the, the way to be free and the way to liberate people is to let your thoughts flow more freely and uh, not to sort of centralize your thought in that way. Um, and again, this criticism of Marxism, I have to say, is, is, is extremely bad and, and it's, it really makes no attempt to find out what Marxism actually thinks because dialectical materialism, it doesn't just say that, oh, well, everything's the same, you know, because we're all part of one universe, everything's just the same and there's one simple law which governs everything. Uh, that's absurd. Dialectical materialism asserts, yes, there are overarching laws such as the law of value, the tendency of capitalism to go into crisis and in nature, you know, Darwin's laws of evolution, you know, many other laws that operate across the world or even the universe. But these are approximations of very complex phenomena. And dialectics has always seen things as being relative to their circumstances and changing all the time. So the idea that it's just kind of a simple law that you just impose onto any situation and you don't need to study anything in its specifics is ridiculous. Um, and you, when you're reading this, you kind of think, well, how can they get away with this awful uh, argument against Marxism and uh, again I think it proves historical materialism because they get away with it because it's useful it's, it's a useful basically for the right wing for the, for the capitalists to have this very trendy allegedly progressive movement but which says uh, that Marxism is fundamentally wrong and there's no real way that capitalism works uh, there's no tendency to revolution or rather there's, there's no necessity to socialist revolution you know that the, having a movement which rejects that and which becomes very in vogue is obviously very helpful. So they can write this stuff, which is frankly terrible, but they just get away with it because, you know, it's useful, basically. And I think that tells you a lot about how ideology is formed, how ideas which serve the ruling class are given a much easier, you know, entry, much, much easier path to dominance, if you like, to publication and, and the rest of it, than uh, ideas which obviously work against the ruling class. Um, <clears throat> anyway, they asserted that instead of, therefore, a working class, i.e. a centre of the revolution, there's simply multiplicities, multiplicities of oppressed people. And I think in this you can see the influence that this kind of thinking has over identity politics. You know, there's no core to a revolution. There's no key, if you like, to changing society. Uh, there's just different people oppressed in different ways, all of whom must be fighting for their liberation and we, we must help them. Um, and they, they basically, everything they say is really against this idea of, of, um, of, of, of sort of having a theory, basically, of centering your thoughts. And what they say is that, um, that it's desire of the body, again, this, this, this thing I mentioned, that the, the, the desire of the body is really what uh, is the source of liberation, and this passion should really be set free. And they basically talk about two key ways that things kind of work, that there's free... Uh, desire and sort of, you know, just things happening in, in, a, in a free way, which is, um, they call some rhizomatics or something along those lines. Um, and I think they call their theory um, uh, rhizoanalysis, or I forget the exact words. And then anything which kind of centers thought or provides a kind of general, you know, theory to anything um, is, uh, they call it arborescence which is taken from trees, because obviously trees have a trunk, which is at the centre, and all the branches flow into the trunk. Uh, and so they call that arborescent. And you just think, when you're reading this, you think, wow, you've discovered that there are, there's unity and there's difference. You know, key philosophical concepts that you've had for hundreds of years. 
you know, uh, that things are different, and yet there's also centrif there's the centripetal and centrifugal forces. Uh, it's not really an incredible discovery, but they just use these new words to describe it, as if it's a totally new thing. And what they say is basic, they, they even go so far as to assert that, and you, again you can see the similarity with a lot of anarchism, particularly with Bakunin here, who often asserted that it's the real revolutionaries are not the working class, but the lumpen proletarians, you know, the, the unemployed, uh, the mentally ill, and people, you know, the, work, the people who are the most downtrodden that you could possibly be. They are the most revolutionary because they're the most downtrodden. And you see the same kind of tendency with, with Deleuze and Guattari. They say, for instance, that um, they even go so far as to assert that schizophrenics or schizophrenia is potentially liberatory. And they see that what they call the schizo subject is the real subversive force within capitalism. Because basically schizophrenics are free of having a theory and a, and a way of looking at the world. <coughs> and... I mean, I find, again, I, just, I find it really astonishing that this is not just being laughed out of the, the intellectual world. But anyway, there you go. That's, that's one of their ideas. They were, they were criticised for that. And what they said is, well, we don't mean like actual schizophrenics. But, you know, you need to sort of use a little bit of schizophrenia uh, to sort of free yourself from, you know, uh, ideological dogmas, basically. Um, I mean, it's just, the, the, as I say, the flippancy that kind of uh, comes out at you from every page of this writing is, is really, really very noticeable. Um, and they also assert that more important than material production and the serving of needs is, um, is desire. You know, desire, again, this idea of desire, bodily desire. Not needs, not material production, not this whole kind of complex world of the economy. Um, and there's no, again, there's no centre to things, you know, and if we just focus more on our desire, then we'd be more free. And you just think, it's so easy to argue against. What is desire but a reflection of human interests and material necessity, which obviously has to be served by an economy? And it is the case that economies do have capital cities, they do have stock exchanges, they do have general tendencies such as economic crises which come about roughly every 10 or so years. You can look at the history of capitalism and find that that's the case. So it's just, I find it laughable. It's, it's just um, false, basically. It's just obviously false. And, um, but it's said because it's useful and because it's trendy, basically, to sort of express this need to move away from what they see as dogmas. Um, they also say, very similar to uh, anarchism again, that um, because everything's about desire, fascism is not really produced by complex class mechanics and political events, but again by desire, it's apparently by the desire for flags, kind of getting turned on by, you know, all the sort of the machismo of, of you know, Hitler and all that stuff. And it's, it's, just, a, it's just a laughable explanation for <laughs> the major events of the 20th century. And they also say that this means that uh, Marxist organisations... Have the same, are basically often fascist because they have the same sort of, um, they, they depend on the same desire for like, you know, flags and sort of symbols basically. Um, and they are basically, they're anarchists, that's what they are, and they do say they're anarchists. And much of other postmodernism veers very close towards anarchism. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's funny because a lot of postmodernists, particularly Baudrillard, but all of them really say that what we need is new ideas. And they basically assert that it doesn't really matter if they're correct, but they need to be new. We need new ideas. We're in a new epoch. We need new ideas. And these ideas are new. They're the ideas of the new epoch. And therefore, that, that's the ideas that we must have. Obvious, it's just obvi obvious that newness is not a, a, the measure of whether or not something is good or useful, but correctness. Um, but actually, even if that were the case, they'd still be wrong, because I don't find many of these ideas really to be new. It's just a repackaging of anarchism, and in many cases, liberalism, in fact. The emphasis on things being different, basically, just smacks to me of, of lib liberals 300 years ago saying that all people are different and we need to respect differences and be tolerant of differences. I don't really find anything new in any of these ideas, other than the terminology that they use. Um, but the main thing is... The main problem is, it's not the flippancy, it's not the, the kind of the weird presentation of the ideas, it's not the rehashing of old ideas. The main problem is a fundamental contradiction, which if you can't say that all theories are wrong, you can't have a theory and we must just go with the body, 
whilst writing a theory, whilst being an intellectual. You know, you kind of want to just say, well, then just go and do it. Be a binned loony, you know. Just go out on the street and live your hobo lifestyle. None of them did it, obviously. Um, they <laughs> really, it's, uh, it's, you know, the point, if you have to, if you're writing a theory, and in fact all human thought is like this, you have to make generalisations. And in fact, Deleuze and Guattari, for example, they make a big, big claim about how, well, we mustn't have any theories, we mustn't have dogmas, we mustn't centralise thought in any way. And then they say that the source of all oppression is the centralisation of thought, which is the biggest claim, the biggest generalisation you could possibly make. The thing is, in reality, you can't get away from making generalisations, especially if you're writing theory. You have to say, this is the reason that things happen, otherwise it's just a waste of time. And so they do say that, but ironically, they make the worst generalisations. They make the worst sort of metaphysical abstractions. This idea that, you know, desire is the source of freedom, but um, territorialising thoughts, you know, hemming in this desire is the source of oppression... Is, is the most metaphysical, most abstract theory you could come up with. There's no real evidence for it. There's no serious attempt to link it to events in human history. Um, and in fact, it's a dogma. And it really reminds me of when people say to you, if you're a Marxist, you often have this study, oh, of course, Marxism is very dogmatic. You mustn't be so dogmatic. Such a dogmatic Marxist. You have that all the time. I'm sure you've heard this thousands of times. That's a dogma. That's liberal dogma because it's not, there's no evidence ever used. There's no real argument. You, people just say it. They think they can say it because basically everyone agrees with it. They don't really need to know what they're saying. Frequently when people say that to you, they don't know what Marxism is. They barely have read any, probably haven't read any Marx. But they, they feel it's fine to say it. That's a dogma because there's no evidence for it. There's no argument for it. It's just asserted and everyone's expected to agree with it. Isn't that really the definition of a dogma? Um, <clears throat> I want to move on to Foucault, who I would say is probably the most uh, important, arguably the most important postmodern. I don't have time, obviously, I'm already beginning to run out of time. I don't have time to go into a lot of his ideas about um, discipline and punishment and things, which is kind of his key idea. I just wanted to focus on this same flaw, really, that you have at the heart of his thought, because he also emphasises uh, the need... He talks about micropolitics, we need to not study macro politics, in other words, politics of the overall <coughs> process of all of society, but micro politics. He's very interested in studying you know, the, the, the politics of small movements and of you know, small parts of capitalist society. Um, and it, in, in, he's probably the most serious postmodernist. He does actually make an attempt to properly study these things. Uh, and he makes some interesting points about you know, the prison system and things like that. But his argument basically is that, well, we can't have a macro theory. We can't have an overarching theory. So it's very much the same idea that other postmodernists have. And um, the thing you want to say to them is, because they all, mostly they present themselves, apart from possibly Baudrillard, who basically just says he's a, he's a nihilist and nothing means anything, uh, and literally says that. Um, but others basically all present themselves as progressive, as wanting to liberate people. And, they see, and Foucault basically sees... Uh, modern thought, you know, the Enlightenment, scientific thought, is really an elaborate attempt to control people's sexuality and their identities. You know, it's, it's a, a kind of horrible system of oppression um, that we categorise people and, have, you know, define how people should live with pseudo-scientific methods. That's essentially what he's saying. Obviously, there's, there's, there's some truth in that. Um, but what he says is, um, uh, is implies, obviously, liberation. And in fact, at times, he talks about the need to liberate different sexualities and different ways of being. But again, you think, well, if, if you don't think that there's an overall structure to society and a, and a definite way that society works and, a, and a, a way it's tending to move and maybe we'll move to a new phase of society such as socialism, if you reject that, which he does, then you think, well, how can you really talk of liberation? You know? where, where are all these liberation movements of different sexualities? and things? Where are they going to end up? What's going to guarantee their victory? What's going to prevent their victories from being reversed? What's the underlying reason that this horrible scientific oppression began in sort of the 18th, 18th or so century? He can't answer that because obviously he, does, he rejects the idea of having a macro theory, as he would call it. So you just think, well, it's kind of, yes, it's very nice to talk about liberation, but you're not, you don't really believe in it if you, if you can't actually diagnose the problems or the solutions to them. And he actually criticised, he, he attacked Marxism. Um, he said he was against Marxism. 
uh, for the very same reason, because it believed in liberation. So he said that, well, he doesn't like Marxism because if you believe in liberation, which the Marxists do, of course, then that implies a fixed human nature, which he rejects. He said there's no human nature. Uh, this is another very typical thing you'll hear. Uh, things are socially constructed. You know, sexuality is socially constructed. It's a social construct. And therefore, there's no um, human nature at all that really exists. Therefore, Marxists imply, by saying liberation, that there is some pure human nature which needs liberating, needs to be set free so it can be true to itself. And he says, well, that's wrong. There is no real human nature that needs liberation. Um, which, again, is, is a horrible straw man of Marxism, because Marxism never says this. We all know that Marxists assert over and over again there's no fixed human nature. Human nature, indeed, is a product of society, of social conditions. Although we add that social conditions are not arbitrary, they're de determined by the material conditions, by the need to produce things in order to live, and that you know, changes over time. So he, liberation, we do, of course, use the word liberation sometimes. <coughs> liberation means, for a Marxist, not rediscovery of some pure, fixed human nature, but the ability to create ourselves really with freedom, with consciously, with consciously to control our fates, you know, con to take in, into hand the conditions of production and meet human need, and therefore to change ourselves in, in who knows what ways in the future. That's the idea of liberation, not the idea of returning to some original state of pure human nature, which he claims is, is implied in what we think. Um, but anyway, he, he also talks of liberation, and you think, well, you can't, that's pretty hypocritical to say that. And you can't, what, is your, what are your grounds for liberation? And this is what he says regarding revolution and Marxism when he rejects it. He says, this is a quote, There is no locus of great refusal, no soul of revolt, no source of all rebellions or pure law of the revolution. Instead, there is a plurality of resistance, each of them a special case which I think is uh, also false. Uh, of course, there are differences between different revolutions and movements, obviously. But there are also centres to revolutions. Revolutions and political movements do concentrate in a certain direction. And they do find figureheads. And they do find lightning rods and, and the key ideas for changing society. And there are some social forces which are more powerful than others, i.e. the working class. He doesn't really make any attempt to... to, to to tackle those ideas, he just says, well, that's a very totalizing way of looking at the world, and therefore we can't have it. And what he proposes, again, I'll, I'll give a quote, what he proposes as an alternative for liberation, given that there's no center of the revolution, is the following. He says, we need to cultivate multiple forms of resistance to encourage the prolifer proliferation of differences of all kinds which I think is really sums up the approach, and, and I think you can also feel that, diff that influence on um, uh, identity politics in, in the, the well, postmodern uh, era, as they would say. Um, and, uh, and you just think, well, what, you're really suggesting that we should proliferate differences, that we should divide people if we want to liberate people, that we should work, basically, to foster divisions. I, pr I presume he doesn't think we should literally foster divisions, but that seems to be the implication. And I would say that the sum effect on the left, on socialism, on any attempt to, 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 to get rid of capitalism, really, of this kind of intellectual trend, has been the proliferation of, of differences and divisions, and a sapping of confidence in the left in itself, basically, over the last 30 or so years. There's no doubt that there are differences between people, obviously, and we can't have a kind of caricatured version of Marxism that denies that. But to, to, to pretend that we don't need to unite our forces and that the working class doesn't have a special role in society because it has its hands on production is just uh, ridiculous and also totally useless as well. And it just ends up being just a sort of, uh, at best, a description of the way that things work. No, I mean, what can you do with that kind of... What kind of explanation is that for how revolutions might unfold or the kind of political program that we should deliver oh just foster differences what differences in what direction um, that really is the tendency and I think you can see that when you look at a lot of the discussion online for instance around identity politics you find that there's no even inkling of a solution to the problems uh, that people talk about they talk about various kinds of oppression and, and it's really just a description 
it's not an analysis, it's not a solution, it's not a program. It's just, oh, this, this thing happens all the time. Isn't that offensive? Isn't that terrible? Oh, aren't these people all uh, the worst people in society? Oh, you know, it's just that over and over again. And wh- whether or not it's, it's true in the individual case is not really the point. It's not a solution, it's not a program, and it's not a way forward. And all it does is sow divisions and sap confidence. And I think it's postmodernism that really is the intellectual uh, you know, um, shadow that is cast over this. Um, right, where am I? Um, <clears throat> finally, just one point again on, on, on the role of, of uh, unity, if you like, or the, the totalizing thought, as they would say, which, of course, they assert is wrong at all times. Uh, it's simply false, you know. And it does, it's not true that if you have a law that governs a process, like the law of value in, in the capitalist economy, it does, just because the law might be quite simple, that doesn't imply that the process itself is simple. You know, Darwin's law, the law of evolution, basically, you know, that, that those that adapt to the, uh, the environment best will outproduce the others. It's a very simple law, really. You can explain it pretty simply. You know, it's basically, you could explain it in a paragraph or two. Of course, there's much more that can be said, but you can sum it up in that. And yet, it, it, you know, quite a lot of different animals exist. <laughs> and I don't think Darwin's uh, idea, which is correct, uh, it really it is supposed to sort of anticipate every... or say that, well, all animals are the same and we've understood what all animals will be for eternity. No, obviously, it's, uh, animals can evolve in a billion and one different ways. And we don't know, we'll know what kind of ways they might evolve in the future. But nevertheless, the idea that the law, if you like, that, that underpins this process is quite a simple one. And there are many other examples. A Mandelbrot set uh, is, is a very simple equation, but it can be used to draw an endlessly changing and yet also similar pattern over and over again. I don't know if you're familiar with a Mandelbrot set, but basically it's a, you know, a mathematical equation which describes you know, the laws by which a pattern is drawn, usually by a computer. And that pattern is just in, you know, goes on and on and on forever, always similar but always um, different in, at each step. And I think that's really how, in many respects, society uh, and the world works, you know, that there are general laws underpinning the process that, that mean that there's a limit to how different things can be, if you like. You know, you can't have a capitalist society somewhere in which everyone's a capitalist and everyone's a billionaire. Obviously, there has to be certain general features to a capitalist society, and there will have to be economic crises uh, of overproduction in any capitalist society. There will have to be these similarities. Nevertheless, each crisis and each revolution is also different. It's not identical and it can't be understood in advance. You have to study the situation concretely. That's elementary, really, to any Marxist. Uh, And I think that's how we should understand the world in general. And we should reject entirely this idea that generalization or universals or whatever you want to call it uh, somehow just is the source of oppression and is wrong. It's It's completely False. Anyway, just to finish then, the last, uh, last point I want to make is why, why did this set of ideas become so prominent? And you could argue that it's really waning in its influence, and I think it is, although obviously it does exert a tremendous influence over a lot of identity politics. Uh, but it, it's, it's really waning in influence, I think, over the last uh, few years. But why did it become so prominent? Well, as I said, there's the crisis of capitalism, capitalism reaching an impasse. The general sense of of doom that hangs over society, at least if you don't have a revolutionary perspective. The presence of nuclear bombs, of environmental disaster, all of these things obviously create a pessimism about humanity and our ability to understand the world and to apply our understanding to improve the world. But also specifically in the 70s, as well as everything I mentioned about Stalinism and and its mechanical version of Marxism and May 68, you also, of course, had the post-war uh, the first post-war recession in the 70s. And ever since then, in the advanced capitalist world, we've been living uh, with a wreckage of industrialization, especially in Britain, but really in all advanced capitalist countries. You have rust belts, you know, you have deindustrialization. You also have the, the sort of so-called utopian like planning schemes, you know, the, the big housing estates that, you, that were built uh, after the Second World War, falling into decay, and uh, being privatised, no, no investment in them, general privatisation across the economy, 
Thatcherism, Reaganism, a sort of a sense that capitalism is, is sort of eating itself almost, you know, it's going backwards. Society's becoming more brutal, more unequal, less civilised. And these ideas, of course, again, spread a pessimism about things and a sense that, well, those ideas like Marxism, that we were going to march uh, serenely towards socialism, which, again, is a caricature of Marxism. But anyway, these ideas, aren't they all a bit naive, really? That's the kind of, I think, the psychology, really, behind these ideas. Um, and, uh, and I think it's quite easy to understand. But as I said, I think that that's, that's really waning now uh, because despite everything that was said... We have returned very much to a classic position of capitalist crisis, and with that has come a polarisation of politics. One of the key ideas that many, especially Baudrillard, many postmodernists spread was the idea that we now live in a, a world of a, a politics dominated by the media and by a kind of simulated politics. You know, everything's fake, basically. It's all just ad like advertising. And they picked up on a, a number of, of campaigns, like uh, the 1988 uh, American presidential election, in which the candidates were very similar in their programme, and Ronald Reagan's campaign was basically all just about how he had a nice smile. And they drew the conclusion from this that, the, well, that's it now. Basically, politics is all just manufactured, doesn't mean anything, and it's all just, you know... And apparently that would be it forever, is how at least Baudrillard implied it would be. Um, which is, of course, an absurd... A, a simplification of what was actually going on at the time... But also, even if that were true, ridiculous to suggest that state of affairs would be around forever. And I think we've now conclusively drawn a line under that epoch. That epoch in which mainstream politicians were all the same and it was all just spin-doctored and controlled from above is clearly finished. There's a massive polarisation in politics. Class struggle is back on the agenda. And it's precisely old-fashioned ideas of socialism that people are returning to. You know? They're not looking to postmodern ideas. They're looking to the likes in Britain of Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour Party. This is some old guy, allegedly some 1970s communist, and yet very popular with young people, as we know. Um, and there's a certain, I think, in the air, a certain kind of earnestness, actually, amongst young people, a sincerity, if you like, which is very different to that sort of cynical irony that you find in the postmodern period. And I think, so I think in many respects that's finished. And it's finished, why? Because of class struggle, basically because of the beginning, at least, of the entry of the working class uh, into the, you know, beginning to exert themselves, beginning to demand um, different kind of politics. And you also see in the style of the politicians, such as Jeremy Corbyn, and even in Do Donald Trump, a kind of more natural, less spin-doctored style, you know, kind of shooting from the hip, speaking as they actually naturally would rather than a kind of Tony Blair-type manufactured, stage-managed politics. Again, I think that, that's not... Uh, we've seen that with Ther Theresa May's attempted, obviously, to have this very manufactured way of presenting herself, and it's just seen as a joke, an embarrassment, basically. De definitely not what people want. So in, in many respects, I think this has been not just disproven for us in theory, but also in history, in real events. Um, and therefore, I think it's obviously Marxism, uh, which is gaining in popularity... Uh, which can answer the, the problems of the modern world, not postmodernism. <clears throat>